Topmed Talk. Hello, I'm Desiree Chapel, and this is Top Med Talk. We are here at the third evidence-based perioperative medicine USA master's course, a perioperative practicum. We're coming to you from the Baylor Medical Campus, the Charles Sammons Cancer Center here in Dallas, Texas. Now I'm joined by Editor-in-Chief of Top Med Talk, Monty Mythen. Good morning, Monty. Good morning, Desiree. We have our special guest with us today, Jaron Mullinger, clinical medical exercise physiologist at Duke and a clinical medical exercise physio- physiologist at Era- Erasmus Medical Center. Did I totally hack all that? Was that terrible? That was perfect. No, no, no. no, no. Go ahead. <laughs> Please pronounce your last name for me. Mullinger. Mullinger. Yeah. That's good, right? That's good, yeah. Jaren? Okay, hey. great. Well, thank M- you. Mollinger. Mollinger. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Yeah. And it's Erasmus Medical Erasmus. Center. Erasmus Medical Center. In the intensive care department. Okay. And yeah. where is Erasmus? In Rotterdam. In Rotterdam. Yeah. All right. And so, how long That's have you been That's a big, been big port right in the north of your country. Is that right? Rotterdam? No, it's not, not the north. It's our center of, of the Netherlands right now. It's, it's the, we call it the, the Randstad. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. yeah. yeah but we have a big port. You've got a big yeah. port there, yeah, haven't you? Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 One of the biggest. Yeah. Oh. Well, Jaren, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having us, yeah. Uh, and I'm going to let you go do a little bit deeper dive into your background sure. in just a second. We're also do- joined by Dr. John Whittle, who is Assistant Professor of Anesthesiology and Critical Care Medicine at Duke. And he also holds an honorary position in perioperative medicine at the University College London. John, thank you for joining us. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Well, guys, thank you for sitting down and, and talking to us. I know, Jaren, um, I reached out on Twitter yes. um, after I saw you tweeting ab- about an article. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I, I thought it would be something that was really interesting that we could you know, expand upon whenever we were here at the meeting. Um, the title of the article, The Malnourished Surgery Patient, A Silent Epidemic in Perioperative Outcomes. You wrote this with uh, Paul Wishmeyer and David Williams, all from all from Duke. All from Duke. Yeah, so yep. the three of you guys. Yep. So tell us a little bit about that. Um, it sounded pretty exciting to listen. To it's um, um, the thing was I, I I posted on Twitter and one of my followers was uh, replying as um, I said it was a n- the new the new kind of um, uh, uh, it's a new kind of uh, how, how can you call it. It's a new awareness, I think, what we're trying mm. to, to reach because yeah, it's, it's old. It's an old kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, the only thing is what we are, I think, not very well uh, in doing so is assessing it prior to surgery. And maybe to make also the loop in our CPAT testing, what we're doing is right now is um, Paul had made the PON score, yeah, the, so the perioperative nutrition, uh, nutrition score, uh, and we combine that with our measurements of muscle mass and muscle quality right now. I think it's a it's a it's a very I think it's our first step in assessing the preoperative patient in regard to being malnourished or nourished. Mm-hmm. Um, I think we have to go. It's, it's just step one because I think it should be. It's, there's there's not one pond score or there's one silver bullet that gives the home malnourished score mm-hmm. because we, s- we still have to have some consensus. I think, and I hope with this article we we can get this discussion coming up. Is um, what is being malnourished? What is the malnourished yeah. phenotype? Yeah. Is it just BMI? Is it just albumin? Is it just a lowering of your of your weight in a specific kind of period? Um, I tend to see it as a more kind of a dynamic phenotype. So one of the things I did in the article was uh, the uh, usage of CT scan analysis, where we can measure bo- m- muscle volume at the L3 level uh, and compare it as a predictive of total body mass and total lean body mass. But we also could see in the CT scan itself um, the density of the muscle. And the density of the muscle is also predictive in regard to um, the amount of fat infiltration in the muscle. The only thing is with CT scans, um, uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an invasive approach. Mm-hmm. So just doing a CT with the question of body composition is a little bit of too far. So yeah. everything which is done with CT is being done retrospectively. Uh, the usage of uh, ultrasound is far more easy. Yeah. So what oh we yeah, did right now is problem. you can just do a probe yeah. and, and it's a, a, a an, um, point of care on the mm, bedside, yeah. whatever you want to do. So what we did was uh, we're using right now, John and I, an, um, um, uh, uh, a technology is called muscle sound. And with muscle sound, we were able to make an ultrasound picture of a muscle. And we can do different kind of muscle groups. And we can then... Uh, assess histology and morphology and architecture of the muscle. So we can assess the thickness of the muscle, the um, uh, thickness of the subcutaneous fat layer. We can assess uh, intramuscular glycine content. We can assess mm. um, um, uh, intra-adipose 
tissue content in the muscle, uh, all based on validation studies done with biopsies and, and MRI. So one of the things we are looking in right now, and that's I think the, uh, the most intriguing part, is that the fat infiltration in the muscle seems to be a very predictive marker and phenotyping of being unconditioned. Hmm. Um, one of the issues we had in assessing patients in regard to their malnourishment or being less fit is what also John said, is they are primarily limited in the peripheral, not in the central part. And the mitochondrial dysfunction is based on the impairment of substrate usage. Hmm. And what we saw was that everyone has issues with the beta oxidation too. So the oxidized fat during your in your resting, but also during, for instance, in your training or in your CPAP testing. And what happens then, if you still use or feed yourself with fats, then the accumulation of fats start to build up in your muscle. And mm. that we call it, the, you have a higher intramuscular fat infiltration. And that gives rise to a phenotype of um, insulin resistance. Um, the muscle itself is not just a contractile kind of organ, it's also an organ who has um, multiple inter-organ crosstalk connections with myokines, etc. So it has a very distinct kind of uh, influence on the whole body, on the kidney, on the liver, on the heart, on the brain. And that's how we approach it right now as the malnourished patient is just not as a patient who has a low BMI or, or it's, a, it's a complete kind of a, I think, a malnourished, deconditioned, uh, much kind of dysfunction phenotyping, what we're going to see. And that has, that has distinct um, um, patterns in regard to, also what we, co- what we talked to yesterday, in regard to uh, delirium, for instance, mm, cognitive yeah. function, because the brain itself is also a very high-density mitochondrial organ. So if I Mm -hmm. I could interrupt for a second and just walk back through a a couple of the abbreviations there. So the the PONS score was this preoperative nutrition score, which I think came out of one of the POKI, Preoperative Quality Initiative Endeavours. So people can find that on the POKI website, POKI.org, P-O-Q-I.org. And the infographics are in there. So that's the score. That's mm-hmm. cool. Then we've talked before with people about this idea that if you're getting a CT scan anyway, yeah. you can look at a cross-section of the psoas mu- muscle, is it? The fillet, yeah. the fillet steak. It's, yeah. 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 Okay. So the, the, the good one. Yeah. The good one. The good one, yeah. Which, which is you go down to a certain level on your lumbar spine and, and they can look at the circumference of it and they can say, oh, that's a nice big fillet muscle. Yeah. The fillet steak there, that's yeah. looking good. Now, that's quite invasive, as you say. You've been using ultrasound, and it's the muscle... What's, what's the scanner again? The muscle... Muscle, muscle sound. sound. Muscle sound. And when yeah. you do that, yeah. not only are you saying that's a nice piece of meat, but yeah. you're looking at whether it, it's it's a fatty piece of meat or not. Now, when I think of fatty meat on the plate, I think of the fat that's wrapped around the meat. But not within the meat. Yeah, so you're yeah. saying this is fat in, in the, the meat. meat. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I'm with yeah. you. Yeah. And if you've got fat in the meat... We were talking yesterday about the sort of Wagyu type of... Yeah. Yeah. They, where they yeah. marbled right through the meat, which makes yeah. it taste very lovely. Yeah. But you're saying if you've got that, that represents a form of malnourishment, and that's bad for you. Yeah. yeah. Cool. So you could scan me potentially and say you might think you're doing okay, Monty, but you've got a lot of fat through your muscle. So here's how, here's how we're going to get it out for absolutely. you. Absolutely. And then that the reason why you said maybe underneath my fat layer, yeah. I could have a good muscle. Yeah. Yeah. Because the fat layer itself is not being... That's what I'm banking on. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think it's important to say, so uh, So again, we're, we're kind of really zooming in on some muscle quality here, but as a on a population basis, yeah. you know, low BMI, yeah, yeah. low albumin, low muscle volume uh, is associated. It's number yeah. one, very common, and number yeah. two is very strongly associated with poor outcome yes. after surgery. Yeah. And now Jeroen is adding an extra layer on that yes. and saying... Well, it's prob- probably if we're personalizing this, uh, i.e. on an individual level instead of a population level, yeah. we can we can add extra stuff, i.e. imaging quality of the muscle as well as the functional quality as well. So uh, a, a good, a, a good uh, example for your mind would be thinking of a Kenyan marathon runner right. uh, with an extremely low BMI, so 18, probably quite a low muscle mass if you were to measure... The, uh, the 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 actual muscle volume, uh, but extremely high quality muscle. Right. Okay. So that that's the extreme example uh, that sort of uh, helps helps decide. You know, helps us push towards a personalised approach to uh, to nutritional assessment. There's there's also a dynamic kind of phenotype. So yeah. not just assessing fat alteration in the muscle itself as just one point. It is the ability to turn over your 
fat infiltration as a substrate usage. That was the question we have. What is an elite athlete? The same way, what is an yeah. is there an elite patient somehow? The elite athlete is not just an athlete with a high VO2 and rubber threshold. It's an athlete who is an, some kind of a hybrid phenotype who can use every single substrate regardless of the oxidative stress. And that's the thing we see in our patients. No. No. They're not able yeah. to do... So they can pull on energy, any energy store that's available to yeah. keep going yeah. is the difference. And also being so efficient possible. For instance, uh, if you're looking at Tour de France bikers, yes, they do six, seven hour stages, whatever. And, and they're remarkably scrawny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. With a very high fat infiltration post. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah they have, yeah. 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 And they are, they, are, they are hybrid kind of phenotyping. They can use fats as high as they're almost an, around their anaerobic thresholds. Well, we are already done doing glycogen. But glycogen is, is our carbohydrates in the muscles. Uh, is a very, we have 400 grams of glycogen in our muscles totally. So it's a very small kind of fuel. So do your Tour de France guys have a lot of fat through their muscle, you're saying? But and they're they, turnover. So they, can, they have high. And do they make the nasty chemicals then as a result of that? Because you were sort of suggesting to me that it, I didn't want fat through my muscle because it also can put out some poisons that can upset my other organs. And it should be used. Okay. So it, that's, that's the thing. It should be this dynamic kind of profile. You have your intramuscular fat high, yeah. you use it, you have to turn over, and you can refill it again. That's we call it, we call it the metabolic paradox. Yes. So you can be having a, 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 an obese patient who has a very high infiltration of fats, but there is no turnover of the fats. That just stays there. And that's, that's, that's the issue. Yeah. All right. Well, so the, the one <clears throat> thing about the, what you learned from, from this and how we can use it is how I'm going to take this home and you know, start using it. What do you think is the biggest takeaway for that? I think the... the uh, <laughs> let me check. Sorry, it was the oh. ponds. I had the pond score up behind. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. We're yeah. cheating on you. Because uh, we sounded very <laughs> clever by reading <laughs> 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 I think, I think the, um, what, what, what you take away from the article itself is the combination of the pond score and the usage of um, muscle histology uh, assessed by CT and ultrasound is, I think, is the next best thing right now. Mm-hmm. And we will see that the, um, it's not just one, one outcome. Yeah, yeah it's just, I think it's and it's a it's a very good first approach for us uh, to make people aware that you can assess it and then you can make some kind of a um, uh, risk index and certificate yes. risk. So as well nourished. what I took away from the article is number one, how common being malnourished is. Yeah. Nice. Yes. In in our surgical population. So that, that's so this two out of three. Two out of three right now. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's astonishing. How how likely that is to result in a complication after surgery, uh, the cost yes. of those complications, and how much money you could save by addressing malnourishment. Uh, so for me, the biggest thing was let's push nutrition to the front of our uh, our assessment uh, of the preoperative patient, and using the tools that we have and this new tool, Pond Score which is a nice simple score that mm-hmm. we can use to help Absolutely. triage to a nutrition clinic and help decide on uh, perioperative management. I think that's a really great step. And then you and I will work on the, uh, on the Wagyu beef <laughs> over, over time. <laughs> but, but, but maybe to, to push it all together, there was, there was, there's one, um, um, our biggest fitness expert in the U.S. is called Jack Lane. Yep. And Jack Lane said, uh, you have your nutrition is your, is your queen and exercise is your, is your king. And both, they are your kingdom. Mm. Yeah. So we should see them not just as a malnourished patient or less trained patient. No, it's 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 all together. We have to push it together. It's it's nutrition and exercise that will give rise to far less risk. And also one of the things you should also I think um uh mm-hmm. from for instance what I saw in our own stuff from the war to home and from ICU to the war, there's also this transitions yes. is essential. Mm-hmm. Because we know when we have, for instance, a very, um, the, the best nourished patient in the ICU going to the ward, that transition is essential, mm-hmm. that the nourishment should be still be taken care of right now. Yeah. And, yeah, I think right now people are less interested in, 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 in nutrition in the ward than in the ICU right now. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, well, guys, thank you so much. I, I think this is such an important conversation. Um, I think it speaks to what we're doing with perioperative medicine and not just trying to help 
the surgical patient, and hopefully this is going to filter into pop, overall population health as well uh, as what we talk about. So thanks again for sitting down with us. Hopefully we'll be following up with you um, about we'll do. It's yeah. pleasure. nutrition yeah. and exercise yeah. in the yeah. coming, uh, coming months and years. So guys, thanks again, and we look forward to our next conversation. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Nima Jerison here. Thanks for listening to Top Med Talk. Now, before we let you go, it's important that we remind you to subscribe to Top Med Talk. That way you'll never, ever miss another episode. Also, if we could encourage you to join us on social media, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube, pretty much every single social media platform, we're there. Join us. And finally, check out topmedtalk.com if you go to our website you can subscribe to email updates that way we can always tell you where we're going to be what we're going to be doing and how you can join us topmedtalk.com and click on the section marked email updates finally top med talk is proud to act as the broadcasting arm of ebpom evidence-based perioperative medicine we'd love you to find out more about them as well ebpom.org is their website that's ebpom.org and if you go to ebpom.org forward slash meetings you can find out about some of the wonderful meetings that we attend and cover across the year here on top med talk that's ebpom.org forward slash meetings